This is the 1912 American Underslung Type 34 Five Passenger Tourist. This car epitomizes the brass era. It came to be known as the Underslung because of the unique orientation of its chassis. So as I understand it, uh, Fred Tone was the chief engineer. And in 1906, when the company started, he came in, received the delivery of the frames, and they were positioned upside down. And that was the eureka moment for him. That's the story, and that resulted in this particular configuration. There's a lot of bling on this car. I mean, the brass is just loud, it's proud, it's beautiful, it's very American. There's color and brass. Do you know what a dub is? I don't think I do. So a dub is a 20 inch rim. And these oh, are dub, these are dub Dude. times two. This to me is where the magic happens with the underslung. You have the frame here, which is flipped upside down, gives you that low center of gravity. You can see where the engine is in relation to the frame. With the lower center of gravity and the frame, they need to bring that size up with these massive 38 inch rims. You got nothing on dubs with this. We have another American underslung, a year younger, that has 43 inch rim. So why the underslung chassis? What does that actually help as far as performance? Cars at this time were being made still like wagons. You notice that most of them were very high. Turning the chassis upside down and lowering the whole car made it more stable. Their boast was that you could tip an American car 55 degrees before it rolled over. Most cars you could only turn about 43 degrees before they flop. Or turn turtle, as exactly. I Exactly, which uh -huh. is kind of an odd selling point, you would think. Right. Until you consider the driving conditions at the time. So this was the safest car in America at, during its time. That was their boast. When they turned that frame upside down yep. and lowered the car, the hood came down this far. I see. They also achieved that by lowering the engine farther down in the frame. If you saw this car a half a mile away, you would say, that's, that's an, underslung. an American underslung. Another thing that really pops out is it's the American, it's American underslung, and they really went for it with this eagle, oh, another yes. eagle, yeah. the American. Yes, this yes, thing yes, is yes. USA all over. It does say America, doesn't it? And this one, of course, is a radiator cap. It's not just a pretty face. Whoa. So in 1913, electricity made it into cars with electric start, headlights. What do we have on our 1912, Stephen? These are gas lights, Bobby. These are actually acetylene headlights. These headlight lenses always hinge like this. You open it up, you put your match in there and light the gas jet. Whoa! Well, you blow into it first to get the excess gas out. You'll learn that the first time you do it. Yeah, you can yeah. lose your eyebrows, probably. You got an arc light in there, basically. Also notice, again, electric star and electric headlights. So this is a crank. It is. This is the last year for the crank as well, because after this, they went to an electric start. There's a lot going on here. It's kind of a busy area. Starting up at the top, windshield, that's kind of a conventional idea at the time, the way it's angled like that. The parking brake is right here. And the other thing on that quadrant is actually the gear shift. And that's a three-speed? It's a three-speed. It starts out outside the car, but it goes up inside the car. That See is how that works? Crazy. And you know, the driver is kind of the important person in the car, they're driving the vehicle, yet you put a bomb right there next to it. That's an acetylene tank, yes, that's for the headlights, that's what runs them. Uh, the horn it has to sound sick. Like, oh, let's hear it. Do you want to hear this beast? I do. Okay. <laughs> I think it is sick. I think it might be. We're at the front end of the car here, looking at the engine, and I know it's a four cylinder, it's 318 cubic inches. That's right, Bobby, manufactured by Teeter Hartley. Okay. It's what they call a T head. That means that the intake valves are on one side of the engine and the exhaust valves are on the other side. I see. The things you're looking at here are called primer cups. First cold start of the day, put a little gasoline in that cup. And when you open the valve, it drops right into the cylinder. It gives you a little bit more oomph on startup. Mm -hmm. Looks like those are period correct spark plugs. Aren't I've never seen these like yeah. that. And what is this black thing down here? That is an air compressor. It's an air pump. This car has a pressurized fuel system, and that copper line runs pressurized air to the fuel tank. It seems pretty compact for how big the car is. It is only 30 horsepower. They so. made three engine varieties in this year. They made a 20, 30, and 50 horsepower engine. This is another nice little feature. This is basically your dipstick. That indicates the, the level of your oil. Oh, I see. So you pick it up and then it goes down and, and stops at the, the crankcase. Oh, very nice. Uh, the fact that this thing could tilt to 55 degrees 
would instill some confidence in you. Doesn't that make you feel better? I mean, I'm not seeing any roll These bars. These bows that hold the top up, they are not a roll cage. And I don't have a seatbelt on, obviously. No, if we flop this thing over, we'd be squished. What do we got going on for the rest of the controls in this thing? Well, it's a little bit austere in this car. This is pretty early days. We only have two things on the dashboard. One is an ignition switch, and the other is an air pressure gauge for that pressurized fuel tank system. So it being a right-hand drive, generally you would feel like the actual gear selector would be in the center, but in this car, it's still on the Maybe right. Maybe not so. It's over here on the right. As we saw before, it starts out on the outside and comes up on the inside, and I shifted inside the car here. The American Motor Car Company made about 45,000 cars in Indianapolis. 10% of those, about 4,000, were underslugs. The survival rate wasn't great. Uh, as I understand, there's about 30 left today. We picked up this car in 2011 as a restoration project. Alan Schmidt of Horseless Carriage actually took the project on in California, and it was a multi-year project. We didn't receive this car in its condition at the museum until 2016. It was a project. And Alan did an astonishing job on this thing. It's just spectacular when you're here in person. Alan's a really good friend of the museum. He's done some excellent work. So with this car being one of the most valuable probably in our collection, we've seen prices north of a million dollars in recent times at auction. Do you think uh, you'd let me drive this car? Well, gee, Bobby, I don't know. Let's think about that. That sounds like a yes. He didn't say no. Okay, it's a yes. Nowadays, you can push to start. You can use a drone app on your phone to start your car. But this car is a crank start. We're gonna try to give it a shot. Switch is on, engaging. Don't wanna break my arm. Just like that. All right, we're gonna try my first shift here in this thing. Double clutch. Oh. Excellent. <laughs> wow! You made it into second gear. That's pretty yeah, good yeah, for yeah. a first try. Oh my goodness. This is spectacular. If, if the ride's a little bouncy, at least it's a comfortable bounce. It's a lot easier to control than a lot of the cars that I've driven from the museum. That's impressive. You'd think something this early would be difficult, but it drives really, really smooth. They have a lot of things figured out very early on. They talk about visibility, there's no hood up here in your face, now is there? Yeah, you're right. You know, the engine being lower than the fenders, you have a great view of the road. There you do. Oh man, low torque. Listen to that. Kind of labor intensive to get it up and running, especially yeah. for instance at night. Right. But once you got it moving, boy, it's a joy. Too easy, Steven. That was amazing. Over the course of two world wars, the price of scrap, especially brass, went through the roof. This meant many of these cars were sacrificed. So this tourist is a rare specimen. Americans' focus was on quality, and their motto was, a car for the discriminating few. Ironically, that turned out not to be a good thing. In 1913, American Motor went into bankruptcy. But what a legacy. Over 45,000 cars produced over an eight-year period, including 4,000 underslugs. Wait, what was the line on that one again? Uh, hold on a second. Let me see what else we got here. What's that? Oh, you like our content? Where are we going now? Uh, the Fountainhead Antigua Museum, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> feel, feel <laughs> Please like and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe. We have a lot of content we want to show you guys, but please hit that subscribe button right now.